I have a so the meeting is ready to start. Oh, I've not heard from Bill. I'm, uh, I'm going to wait one more minute. Uh, Bill is here and I'm sure he's in. Oh, Bill's yep, I'm online. Good for him. Let me know. Both uh, Jeff Heller and Bill Connors are here via Zoom. Okay. Uh, and we, we can convene. That was 6.30. We have a quorum. And Wait for you probably do the approval of the minutes for that or not? Yeah, actually, so um, the minutes were just handed out. Um, and I don't want to ask people to scrutinize them and read them now and, and, and brush through, through them. And I would like people's attention because, David, I know that you would. Uh, you wouldn't short you would take any shortcuts. So I'd like to have your attention and there's no rush. So if you guys would take these minutes and uh, review them and we'll vote them uh, in um, approved next week. Is that, is that okay? Sure. Uh, they weren't sent out ahead of time, I guess. I forgot to send them. Oh, okay. And none of us asked you for them. And, and, I, and I, didn't, I, I didn't follow up all summer long. You know, um, <clears throat> And we appreciate Kip's uh, uh, minutes and, and, and presence. It's uh, we, we struggled with minutes over the years. No Dave, can you send those electronically as well for those not at the meeting? Uh, Bill, I'll send them out uh, this evening after the meeting's over. I don't have Great, access to my file. Thank you. Uh, another reason to table it till, uh, till, till next week uh, or next meeting. Right. Um, so, I'm too, Greg, if you would give us, uh, you know, your update in, in the oh, yeah. second agenda item and... Yeah. Um, is he my background? <coughs> um, oh, okay. So, just tell me when you want me to do it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to kind of, kind of go through the agenda. Yep. Um, well, you could use your mouse though, right? It's, it's wireless. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to talk about a couple of different things. One would be uh, the fee adjustment to our municipal compost that we make at the RTS. I'll provide you a, kind of an update on a, a few items. Um, one would be the Millbury Consortium. Uh, that would be some of the work that I've been doing on establishing contracts with the 36 member communities who have waste to waste contracts um, for trash disposal up in Willowbrook or Millbury. I uh, talk a little bit about our, about our existing food waste recycling program. We have drop off as you know, at the RTS and we're expanding the number of public schools who are utilizing the program. Talk about the proposed styrofoam recycling program. It's kind of a repeat of what we talked about last time. Uh, we are working on a November 2nd uh, recycling solid waste form to be held at the library. I want to talk a little bit about that. And then as I like to do, just give the members a snapshot of what's going on with regards to our commercial waste tonnages and revenues, and also our residential waste and recycling tonnages. And of importance is some significant changes that are happening in the recycling market and revenue decreases that we're seeing for what we send to our under our contract and then any other issues that may come up for discussion. So a first item on the agenda would be the fee schedule adjustment. So as I think everyone here realizes, unscreened compost is made from all of the leaves, grass and brush that are brought to the transfer station by residents and some a limited amount that's brought by contractors. That material is laid out in those long rows and then we process it through the town owns trommel screen and a half inch screen. The, the product of that process is compost. And we presently sell that compost 
to residents, $2 per 30 gallon barrel, and to contractors at $12 per cubic yard. So that's a little bit of background about our present operation there. Now, traditionally, the town has had an agreement with a vendor, a private company, to market and sell the town's compost. That's made to that process I just described. Historically, AgRecycle has been that private company. And in early 2022, the town went out to bid to solicit that service. And AgRecycle was one of two companies that did submit a proposal to the town. And they were looking to market and sell the compost for $4 a yard. We did not enter into an agreement with AgriCycle based upon that process. And we, the town instead, at my recommendation, decided to try and market and compost the, uh, to market and sell the compost ourselves, which while I wouldn't call it a mistake, the, the motivation behind it was that the $4 per cubic yard was unbelievably low and it was almost insulting. So we decided we could do better ourselves. In fact, what has happened is we've discovered that the marketing of compost is extremely difficult not because we, we don't have contacts and we can't move material, we would normally be able to move material, but there are two things that are going on. Um, but before I get into that, I would just say, when we can't move compost at the RTS, that presents significant operational challenges because as you probably know, if you spend any time at the RTS, the material is always coming in year round, it's a year round operation, grass, brush, leaves are always coming in. And when we're not selling screen compost, when we're not selling that compost, that finite five acre site becomes filled very, very quickly. And we need to ensure at, at this time of the year that we have space on that five acre site to be prepared for the inundation of leaves in November and to be prepared for our snow dump operations in December and where we need about two and a half acres of, of the five acre site to be reserved, vacant and clear for incoming snow. So with all that being said, we need to look at the fee structure. So again, the existing fee structure is $12 a yard for contractors and $4, uh, and we're looking to change that to $4. And we're also looking to change the residential fee, which again is $2 for that uh, 30 yard container, and basically waiving that fee in its entirety. So the, the question might be, why are we looking to do this? Never mind the operational end of it, but just the reality out there, and it's, this is, this is the, the conundrum that we're having with marketing our own material, is that we have now, in the eight years that I've been here, many more companies that are making compost, way more than were when I first started eight years ago. And because of that, there is more compost and there's less demand. The other, and some of those companies I'll cite here, AgriCycle Black Compost, Landscape Express, Chain Stores are now selling this stuff. We have local landscapers who are investing in the equipment to make compost. And the drought this year in particular has really, really impacted the amount we can move because nobody was planting anything during the, the, the height of the drought. So we have to have a plan in place beyond just marketing ourselves to help us move this. And one of the things that we are recommending doing is significantly reducing the fee for compost, going from $12 a yard down to $4, which is what our uh, one of the largest regional companies, AgriCycle, was willing to pay the town to, to market and move the material. So we, we're, we're not really looking at compost from the point of view of, of making revenue because we're no longer an enterprise account. So we're not relying upon revenues um, to offset expenses, which is what you wanna do when you have an enterprise account. Although we don't wanna give it away. So we feel $4 is, is a way to market it, market it successfully. You can sue. Mm -hmm. I missed that. No, she was just talking about it. Oh. Um, <laughs> And also, we're also looking to waive the residential fee again from $2, from $2 for that 30 yard container to nothing again, just kind of help us move the compost, which really is from an operational perspective, the most important thing down there. We have to always have space for the incoming to process and, and make way for, for that never ending stream of material. So that the recommendation there is when we have an operational issue that we have to contend with and we need to make that the sale price more marketable to compete with what uh, other companies are doing out there. So um, happy to answer any questions about that, but that would be one uh, uh, issue of importance that we'd like to get addressed this evening. So would AgriCycle then, since they're doing it before, would we go through them to do it or? No, so this would be something we continue to do on our own, but it sends a strong signal to the market that we that our prices have been reduced significantly and we're hoping that drives interest in having contractors come here to buy material. Is there a time limit for this 
revised pricing or is, is this through to the winter season? This would be a price change that would go into effect as soon as this, the select board um, permitted the revision to the fee structure. We're hoping to go to the select board on September 26th. So whenever that fee um, could go into effect sometime in November or December, we'd be looking to have that uh, in place uh, and not subject to change unless I, unless I came back and made a recommendation to change that again. Okay. And are we looking to go back out to bid to other for contractors to manage this on a, a more permanent basis again? Um, that's probably that if we were going to do that, wouldn't that would not be something we do until next spring? Okay. Would AgriCycle be a, an option back then, or so I can't speak for AgriCycle, but I'm, but they, they may they may submit um, a response to a bid for did the service. Their, did we hurt if, their feelings? If we. Well, you, you know, it's hard to say whether we hurt their feelings or not, but I, but, um, you know, they significantly expanded their operations. Um, you know, they, they used to beat the doors down and need them to come and, and buy our material. Yeah. But again, I go back to the whole idea of there are more companies out there, weather conditions have changed, our droughts are longer, right. our dry seasons are longer, and people aren't planting at the heights of the summer. So we were having a really, really hard time moving material under our present structure. And I'm hoping revising the structure, revising the fee schedule allows us to move more material. And of course, I think the market is similarly priced, right? There are other places that are selling. No, there are other places that are selling for, for higher than that. But again, I think, you know, it's other places, you know, there were, there were other, you know, AgriCycle has you know, massive, massive yards. They have you know, dozens and dozens of acres well beyond what we have. We have a very finite amount of space with, with a very, very aggressive program where material just keeps coming in and coming in. I don't, I, as the manager there, I don't have the, the, the the luxury of space like Sam White has or AgriCycle has. They have huge, huge yards with all kinds of space to stack material and, and sit on it. We don't have that luxury. We have to move material that, that we make or we, we literally run out of space and then the machine breaks down. And eventually we'd have to haul it away ourselves if it gets too bad. Yeah. And so, just... so actually, um... You're you're asking us to you know to approve of, of a fee that gives an incentive to move this fast and and to go before the selectmen. We would want the, this to go uh, in front of the selectmen as soon as quickly and, and have them make it an immediate change. And you could advertise it and you got to sell. And and of course the I would assume that the fall uh, cleanup and yard preparation for for the for for the winter. Is a, is a high time to use a lot of compost for landscaping companies. Yeah, you know, and you know something, Jeff, you're absolutely right. You know, part, part of my kind of calculation on this whole thing is that, you know, given that it's been a little bit warmer, um, we, we may have a longer planting season into the fall. And if we can get the fee structure revised soon and be able to sell compost to commercial entities at $4 a ton before, before it gets cold, we may be able to capitalize on a longer planting season in, in the fall. People are out there working on yards, you know, spreading compost on lawns and so on. So I would love to be able to tap into that if we can get the fee schedule adjusted as possible. Okay, do, um, do we have any other questions? I, you know, I, I would ask for a motion. We can open it for more discussion or... Um, Just one suggestion um, that uh, there's that sign outside the RTS that we never actually use for anything but the RTS. But it would be great if this gets approved to put something up there that could cycle through that says compost is free for residents. Yeah, well, exactly. And there would, they would be a lot of changes to the website and to our signage, things like that that we could do fairly quickly. Um, but, but again, I, I don't want to get all my stuff to do that until I have permission to do so. So Greg, um, just for curiosity's sake, um, I mean, how much revenue does uh, the compost generate for you from the, from the residents at, at, you know, you know, at, at two dollars a two dollars a pop, and, and half the time I see that you know over the years, um, you know, someone you know, not everybody wants to fill up a thirty you know thirty gallon barrel, so they go in there with a kitchen barrel and and, and fill up, or they or the little the little trays like that, and you know, and the, and the people at the at, at the thing just you know like that, and, you know, they're not going to charge someone else fifty cents for you know, right, right? So so much of it it probably goes to residents for nothing. There's a lot of it that goes to the residents for nothing. It's an unmonitored site. We don't have staff. There wouldn't sure. have cameras there. Um, I, I've actually observed that people are just taking compost and putting their cars and, and, and off they go. And I don't, 
I'm not going to dither over, you know, a dollar or two dollars. Um, it, it's it's good for the operation to have residents take it and, and use now, it. How much? But, for, okay. but but to answer your question though about about sales, I know I don't have that figure with me. I can certainly get that very easily. We we track all that in the sales, but it's not a lot. It's not big money. That's all. I didn't want the exact. Numbers. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 what I would say, it's not big money. We don't monitor it, and I know a lot of residents who are using it aren't paying for it. Not out of malicious intent. It's just they probably don't even see the sign. You know, and and. And there was a time when you got a lot of revenue from your compost, and and, and yeah. you're and and now you're just you know, things are as everything change everything changes, and uh, so um, we would be seeking the board to uh, uh, change the current rates to no charge for residents and uh, to four dollars a yard for commercial operations, <laughs> and the price would stay that way until we uh, go back to the board probably late spring, early summer, to do our update to all the fees. And we'll do a look to see if we need to adjust our composting uh, fees at that time. But again, the important thing is to move the product off of the site. Right. And I, I mean, we that's what we're going to be faced with there. And you're gonna, it's not going to be a revenue stream for, for us like this if we have to you know move it continually. Well, I think Dave, Dave, Dave said exactly the right thing. It's it's either we get some money to move it by private companies yep. or the town pays to get to, to give it off site. So I, I'd prefer not to go to the latter. I would rather be in the position of having the former occur there. I'm supportive of it. Can, can we have a motion to, uh, as Dave uh, uh, worded it, to change the fee schedule? Motion to change the fee schedule? To. Um, it's motion to recommend the fee oh, right. uh, schedule of no charge to residents and a four dollars per yard for commercial accounts uh, to the select board. And could we put a, a, a for to be um, adjusted um, immediately? Uh, we've asked the selectmen, uh, you know, the select board to do that in the past. I suspect since the prices are going down, they'd probably be receptive to that. <laughs> Yes. Okay. okay, that was a big mouthful. Motion to recommend the prices go to zero dollars for residents and four dollars per cubic yard. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And all, 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 all the nays. No, it's unanimous. We have September. Do we say September twenty six? It'll, uh, it'll be the 27th, actually, Tuesday the 27th. Is the other chat still with us? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so we, I know we have some uh, some new members, and I thought I'd, I'd walk the, the, the community members through this. So I think, as everyone knows, the town of Needham is a <clears throat> member community of what's referred to as the Millbury Consortium. The Millbury Consortium is a group of 36 communities that have negotiated as a group, a long-term disposal contract with which, what is now Wind Waste Innovations, used to be Wheelabrator, now it's Wind Waste Innovations. They are the owner of the Millbury Energy from Waste or EWF facility that accepts all of the Millbury Consortium member communities trash. We have a contract in place along with the other members of the consortium that will expire on December 31st of 2027. And those consortium members are being contacted by me to elicit interest in a new disposal contract. So I've been calling all of the 36, I haven't gone through the complete list yet, but I'm generating names, levels of interest, we're talking with people, email addresses to see if what their level of interest is in participating in some kind of a dialogue with wind waste solutions, wind waste innovations, I should say, for a new contract. Uh, I've established a relationship with uh, wind waste New England market manager, Gary Collins, and he has also agreed it's a great time to start. Um, these contracts, are, they tend to be complicated. And I think the important thing to understand about the process would be, we're not just gonna be looking at wind waste innovations, uh, or, or, or energy from waste, it would be these other disposal options for the community to consider or for the consortium to consider. Uh, again, I'm not driving the bus here. I'm simply looking to elicit, in, elicit information. 
and and support in beginning this process. But again, the, the response has been overwhelmingly, yes, we need to get working on this. So um, I had started talking with the director about this uh, several months ago. She did agree. She thought it was a good idea for me to kind of take a lead on this. And again, this is kind of what we're working on doing. I'm hoping that before Christmas, we'll have all of the services communities contacted. I'm sure everyone will probably be in some general sense of agreement about beginning a process, and then we'll see who takes who takes the lead. Again, I just wanted to bring you up to speed on that. Greg, what would be your uh, hope for timing to, to get a, a, a new contract in place or an extension or whatever? What would, what's, what would be your target? Knowing that we're starting now and the contract is still good for four years. So um, I would imagine this process is going to take all the three or four years. Um, I, I, what, what I would say is uh, in one of my previous jobs, I was I did this the identical process, although it was with 13 communities, not 36. And that that, that process ran about three years. So the, it, the, and so you multiply you know, the number of communities that we're talking about beyond just the 12 or 13 that I did in, in my previous one of my previous jobs. This this is just complicated stuff. It takes a long time to get, to get consensus. If, if you're going to go down the road of doing like alternatives analysis and looking at other other possible alternatives beyond just a, a energy from waste, there are other out of state railing options that the town can consider. But just to go through that whole process takes a huge amount of time. So I, I think uh, where we are right now, 2022, we have five years until the contract expires. I think this is a great time to begin having these discussions because I believe it's going to take us at least four years to be in a comfortable position where we can say, yes, this is what we want to do for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, many of you are, are likely aware that the town has been very generous in providing funding to support a food waste recycling program. At the present time, we have food waste recycling at Broadmeadow and Sydney Williams. And then it shouldn't be last of it, it should be the high school will begin late September of 2022. We'll be beginning their program. So we'll have three of the eight public schools that will have a food waste recycling program by October. We also have a residential food waste recycling drop-off program at the transfer station. So with that in mind, I thought I'd just kind of run through you with some of the numbers because I'm getting a lot of questions about numbers and costs and so on. So there is a fee structure associated with, with this program. And it's a three-tier, um, three-tier, uh, three-prong, if you will, um, structure. So there's a monthly barrel fee. So we have, let, for example, we have eight barrels at the transfer station and all the schools have four barrels each. So we pay a monthly rental fee for those barrels to AgriCycle, who is our contracted vendor that provides the service. There's a scheduled service fee for the truck to drive to the RTF. So every time the truck comes to the transfer station, they hit us up for $48. That's, just, that's, that's scheduled every other, or twice a week, twice a week collection. There's also a scheduled service fee for the trucks to drive to the schools, that's $31. So every time they come to the schools, that they charge $31. Again, twice weekly. And then there's a tip fee. So every time the, the truck, uh, the operator has to grab a barrel and dump those contents into the, into the truck, it's $9.50 each. Again, on average, when we look at the numbers uh, over the 10 months of the program, on average, we're doing four barrels at the schools and seven barrels at the RTS uh, every time they come to those facilities. And again, that's twice a week. So when you put this table together, so let's kind of run through this. So Dave, you, you, you might want to just kind of click on the, and you'll see the, right, so the red squares that come up. So let's take a look at the RTS and the food waste for the schools. So uh, since the inception of these programs, last 10 months at the RTS, seven months for the schools, 89 tons of food waste has been recycled. That averages out to about 10.1 tons per month. And the total program costs would be almost $14,000. Now, if we were to take this, proceed, Dave, thank you. If we were to dispose of that food as trash, it would be $8,225. And we come up with that calculation because if you follow the asterisk below the table, 
uh, our tip fee for trash is $71.07 per ton. So if we took those 89 tons and delivered them to Wheeler Brader or to Wind Waste, it would be 6,325. And 89 tons of food waste would require about four of our 100 yard trailers, $750 per trailer, 1900 and I'm sorry, $375 per trailer would be about $1,900. So you combine those two when you get about $8,225 to dispose of that as trash. The cost per ton would be $92.40 as trash. And the cost per ton to recycle is $156.92. So it's 70% more expensive to run this program as a sustainability green initiative. So I've been having, lots of people have been asking me this, you know, is it more expensive to recycle it? Is it more expensive to burn it? It's clearly more expensive to recycle. What I would say is that as time goes on, and I think as the programs mature, that gap may close a little bit. But what I'm concerned about is when the contract with AgriCycle ends and we go back out to bid, very likely if we, if we renew our contract with this existing vendor, the costs of fuel, Everything's just going to going to go through the roof. So these programs are going to be more expensive than our traditional disposal programs. But again, I think we go back to the community and say this is a policy issue. Do you want to be spending more money and 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 have need them be green and sustainable, or or is that not a priority for you? So again, I think having some of these numbers will allow us to have that discussion if if the select board wants to go there. Okay. Yes. Is the um, the composting barrels that um, at at the transfer station that are accessible to, to the residents? Is that part of this? Is that a function of that included in this? Um, so you, so you're saying are you asking about the food waste recycling program at the RTS? Yes. Yes. So 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 that is so when we talk about RTS food waste, 449 barrels in the upper left. That's the drop off program at the RTS. Okay. Yeah. And so you can see we've done. 62 tons of, uh, of recycling there. We, we pulled that out of the uh, out of the waste stream and we're recycling that. So, so that's well that's very well subscribed by the town. Residents have been residents love it. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean only hear I only hear great feedback on it. So residents. And that's reinforced by those numbers. Yeah. So I think that I think there'd probably be a lot of support uh, in, in the town for this uh, because you know the accepting of, of this because I think People are supportive by having something to do with this. Yeah, and I'm hoping so. And again, again, I don't look at it from the point of view where it's really a budget buster. You know, we do have a line item in the budget. Um, and and if you look at what we've what we've expended over the last 10 months, it's only been fourteen thousand dollars. So it's not a budget buster. But again, I kind of go back to you know, the town has made a lot of progress in a lot of green initiatives, wanted to become more sustainable. And I think this is just another feather in the cap and of you, the town going there. Can, and you've explained to us that this is also anticipation because the regulations are going to come that direction where this is going to be a requirement. Now it's not, right? right? But eventually. Yeah, so, so and that's a, great, that's a great point, Jeff. So, you know, we have talked about the Department of Environmental Protection's waste ban items. So as everyone may be aware, the DEP says that there are certain items in our waste stream that uh, must be recycled. That's you know, textiles and uh, you know um, bottles, cans, paper, cardboard, scrap metal. There's a whole slew of things. What I've sought to do is I've sought to keep Needham ahead of our waste bin because it's a whole lot easier to uh, to be in compliance with a proposed waste ban than to scramble and put a program together and find money when a ban is is put in front of you. So, you know, we're, we're well ahead, like there's, there's a mattress and textile recycling ban starting in November. We've had existing programs in place for years in you know, so we're fully in compliance with those bans. So we're not scrambling to, to get those in place, but it's the same thing with food waste. There are commercial food waste bans in Massachusetts, not residential food waste bans. And I guarantee you, given our capacity issues, which we'll talk about tonight, that a residential food waste ban is coming. It, it, I would bet my house on it. And it's just good for Needham or any community to be well ahead of bands because it just saves you all that, the challenge of finding money and developing interest and support for programs, which for some communities can be really challenging. Yeah. So this is the other Jeff Heller. I guess I have a quick question. And you might have said this. I, I had a connection problem there. This program, we're contractually obligated to this particular vendor until when? 
So this is a three-year contract. We've just extended it. So we, we're, we have another two years on the contract. Okay. And the reason that I asked that, and I brought this up in the other meeting is um, I'm a user of, uh, of Black Earth, right? And they're in need of picking up at a number of different houses anyway. I just have, a, a, I guess I'm curious as to if that two years from now would be an alternative that would be more cost effective than the company up in Maine. And, and Jeff, that's a great question. And let me just maybe a little bit of background on that. So Black Earth Compost, when the town went out to bid for this service about a year and a half ago, Black Earth Compost did solicit a response to that bid. The reason that the town did not go with Black Earth is because Black Earth, um, they have a process which is very different from our current vendor in Maine, AgriCycle. And one of the key differences is that Black Earth did not want any kind of non-organic matter in the food waste stream. And I was adamant that whoever we ended up doing business with had infrastructure that would allow residents to put food waste in a plastic bag or a paper bag and not have to dither or worry about, oh my God, there's a, there's a trace amount of plastic in the food waste, I gotta pull that out. It may, residents don't want to be challenged in that way. They want simplicity and ease. And one of the ways to make it easy and successful for residents is to say, yeah, put it all into a plastic container. If there's trace amounts of non-organics in there, don't worry about it, the vendor will deal with it. And the way AgriCycle deals with it, that Black Earth compost they could not, is that AgriCycle had the means through a depackaging technology to actually take that food waste when it's tipped at their facility, run it through a processing machine where the non-organics is separate from the organics. So when you look at ease of use, simplicity, expediency, which is what, one, those are the objectives that I had to make the program a success. Black Earth could not comply with that requirement to the bidding process and AgriCycle could, which is why we went with it. Okay, understood. That that's helpful. And again, maybe after two years, we we can go back to the residents and say, "Hey, this is part of the sacrifice, right?" Um, if if people are truly vested, can we move away from some of the restrictiveness? So, yeah, Jeff, I think that's a great point. So, you know, one of the things that we could do is we could try to examine the input, if you will, and see if, see if there is uh, support amongst people who are patronizing the RTS and utilizing the program to say, would you be willing to bring all of your organic matter in a paper <coughs> bag? Let's say, no, paper bags can be wet and sloppy because food went too wet and sloppy. That could be a problem. But if people are willing to do that and not put any organic or non-organic material into the stream, then we could give, we could give to consideration to a company like Black Earth that doesn't want to see that in there to start with. Well, there's two, isn't there? There's one aspect is whether the residents are willing to do it. The other aspect is the smells and the everything else. Wasn't didn't that also factor into it? Because if we can't have it in plastic bags, it's going to cause more odors and issues. At the well, 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 the barrels would have to be lined with plastic. Um, I see. But but what you could do is you could simply take the barrels and and upend them into the packer and just have it all spill out of the plastic bags and that will go into the trash. But I think it's more, it's more a discussion with people who are utilizing the program to say, are you prepared to have 100% of the material you're putting into those containers organic with no non-organics? I think that's a challenge. I think there are a segment of the population that may be willing to do that or try to do that, but I think that there's a segment of the population that are gonna be like, well, um, I'm either not gonna use the program at all or I'm not gonna be compliant with, with the, the, the idea or the notion of uh, no non-organics in the, in, the, in, the, in the stream. So again, I, I think we can, we can monitor the success of the program and we can kind of keep our eyes on, on that, may, maybe gauge, uh, I, can, I can gauge people who are utilizing it and see what their level of support is, Jeff. But I, my sense of the program and of, of people down there who I observe every day and their habits, I think that's a far cry from reality. We can circle back to it anyway in a year or two, right? Or like at least another year uh, and see. You know, those, those of you who are new to the committee, you know, for 20 something years, you know, uh, the, the most consistent discussion item has been contamination, contamination, contamination. 
you know, and the motivation for people to, um, you know, to, 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 to screen things out. You know, if you come, uh, I know I, I'm, I'm not, you know, even if we did some survey and thought that there was a good, you know, um, you, your experience of going down to the transfer station, you know, the simplest thing of people putting, you know, going through all the trouble to collect their bottles and they can't seem to tip the bag upside down and drop it into, you know, into the bin. In, in, yeah. Into the bin, right. It is the simplest thing like that. They can't take it out of, and not that paper is as much of a problem, but still, you can't take it out of the paper. You know, why can't you put cardboard in the cardboard thing and not put the cardboard in the paper thing? I, you know, it's simple. I sometimes go in there and it's right there on the top. I take it out and do that. But so we're not confident in people's level of compliance. And if we have contracts based on, <coughs> on that, we, if we find somebody who's accepting of all the contamination, you know, uh, that was where or I would be leaning because I am not well, confident. So, so here's an interesting one. We could divvy up the schools because the school is easy enough to make it compliant, right? And we don't have to worry about trash bags or being used and we don't have to worry about organic versus non-organic. And that might well, be- uh, I, I saw a couple of people roll their eyes. I'm not 100% okay. sure that assumption. May, may I suggest that we table the- Yeah, 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 maybe it's a better, better, better yeah. yeah. I was just, yeah. I was doing a sort of a foreshadow uh, for an yeah. education point of what we faced as a committee over the years. Uh, a good one for the parking lot, I think. Yep. And I, and I would just say about the schools, same issue with the schools. We have all kinds of kids eating carrots that come in plastic bags. And, and, and we, we just designed the whole program to be easy for everyone involved. And that's why we went with that company that can separate the non organics from the organics. I mean, they must have a big demand because, they, because of that, right? There's so many people who must look at that and say, oh, wow, I don't have to worry about contamination. You know? it, it's a big part of their, of their selling is to be able to say, yeah, you, know, you don't have to worry about a plastic fork being in there and getting a, getting a fine or whatever because they're, they're, they're kind of proprietary technology that allows them to pull that out. Is, is, believe me, it was music to my ears when I heard that. Yeah. So. Anyway, um, so this is a repeat of last time, so I'm going to go through it very quickly. We're looking to begin a styrofoam recycling program at the transfer station in December. Um, it just we're working with a local company, Canigli Arrow. Uh, the program cost would be about $475 every time we brought a, uh, a container's worth of styrofoam down to their uh, their facility in Framingham, we're anticipating uh, it would be about $9,500 per year. So it would be, it would be a non-contracted service with Canigli Arrow. David, if you want to advance that. Um, we, would, we have containers like this on site at the transfer station. We would fill up one of these every three or four weeks. Uh, just as an example, some of our sister communities that are presently doing this right now, Franklin, Medway, Arlington, and Norwood. Uh, it would be a, we're anticipating based upon our, our throughput right now about $9,500 a year for this service. And in case you're wondering what happens to it, uh, Canigli Arrow takes it, they shred it, they form it into bricks, which they again sell. And those companies remount, pelletize, and make new products, principally picture frames seem to be the, the reuse application for this. And right now, what do we do with styrofoam? Styrofoam is a very messy, annoying product that we process on site at the transfer station. Then we have a truck up to Millbury where it's burned, not good for the environment. And certainly from an operational point of view, I hate dealing with it because it just blows all over creation and makes a big mess. So I'd love to recycle it and have it that way. That way. So um, one of the things that we did three years ago or might've been four years ago, what time goes by so fast, but we did, it was a great success in my mind and a benefit to the community was we did a forum at the library where we talked about solid waste and recycling issues. I've, I'm looking forward to doing this again this year and I've contacted Casella Recycling, who's our contracted vendor for our, our recyclables. That's cardboard, paper, and commingled and single stream. Wind Waste Innovations, they're our contracted vendor for our trash. They own the uh, Millbury Energy to Waste Facility and also having mass DEP come down. And the objectives would be to talk a little bit to the community, again, kind of a reminder of what we do at the transfer station, what's our recycling and solid waste operations. Um, talk a little bit about our existing Casella recycling contract, uh, what is presently recycled, um, get a little bit of insight from Casella recycling staff 
on kind of what's going on out there in the world. It's a very complicated world. And certainly when it comes to the value of these materials, it fluctuates and changes all over the place. And the prices right now are uh, certainly on the downside. And what, what are some of the market forces that are driving that? And then get a little bit of an update from myself, the Casella staff, on what can and can't be recycled. That was a big theme of the last forum that we did four years ago. The public just seems to be eternally confused about what can and can't be recycled. And it's a great time to answer people's myriad of questions about, can I recycle this and can I, can I do this? It's a great time to just answer those basic questions. And, and the, 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 the public turnout was great and the, the, the dialogue was really, really helpful. And then something that I think most residents aren't aware of, but leads into, I think, very interesting discussion. It would be the Mass Department of Environmental Protection staff who have agreed to come down and talk about the 2030 Solid Waste Master Plan and how it relates to municipal recycling waste bans. We just talked about that a few minutes ago. And more importantly, I believe, the issue of the landfill capacity crisis that will drive the dialogue for the Millbury Consortium and what we need them and those other communities will do with regard to our longer term solid waste disposal concerns. And again, that issue is driven by the, the capacity crisis that was well articulated in the, in the master plan, the DEP's master plan talking about, about the imminent crisis that New England is facing because we're running out of landfill space. And then what do we do about it? And one of the things the DEP wants to do about it is they want to ban more material from going into the trash stream, thus the November mattress and textile bans. That's one way to, to kind of slow down this impending crisis. But there's really no long, there's no long-term solution. So that, again, that's all part of what we need to talk about with the Millbury Consortium. And, and again, so, so the, the forum will talk about solid waste and recycling issues that I think are, are of import to the community and just try to have a, a good dialogue about what we do and what we want the residents to do to be in compliance with our contracts. So the snapshot, I, I kind of like to run through this with everyone so that we, you just kind of have a sense of, of the numbers because it's easy to talk about the programs, but let's take a look at the numbers and what goes on out there. So again, this is kind of those red boxes again. So bulky tons, a lot of people when they see this, they go, what are bulky tons? So there's a number of, uh, of types of waste that we deal with out there. Bulky is the commercial trash that comes into the facility. It's the non-yellow bag trash. We see a lot of bulky waste coming in from contractors and from residents who bring in mattresses or they bring in carpets or they bring in other big bulky items that will put into yellow bags. So we call that bulky bulky waste. So the bulky tons for FY 2021 20, and 22 are shown. And you can see, David, if you advance next, you can see that there's been a 37% increase in the amount of bulky waste that we're handling at the, at the RTS since FY 20. Now, concurrently, there's revenues associated with that. We charge $140 per ton for contractor waste that goes over our scale. And we have other fees for other bulky items. If you bring us some carpets, let's say there's a, there's a $20 fee. If you bring a mattress in, it's a $20 fee. But if you combine all those bulky fees, okay, you'll see there's a 34% increase in the fees that we've collected since FY20. So we're almost at a million dollars in revenues that the RTS has collected from just handling bulky waste. So if you look at our pays as throw counts, pays is always the yellow bag trash that's disposed there. So we have four, we have what, six containers at the drop-off wall, two at each wall. You throw your yellow bags in and you can see that, uh, next, next slide, there's been a 6% increase in our yellow bag trash. The other trash component, if you will, bulky, pay to throw and municipal, this is the trash that our DPW staff drives out to our parks and our green spaces in town and pick, collects the barrels. And you can see that there has been a 46% decrease in our municipal trash during this time period. And a lot of that is driven by the fact that we saw a significant decrease in people being outdoors, patronizing public spaces during COVID. So it would make sense that we would see a significant decrease there. So when we look at all the tons that we're sending to Wheelerbrenner during this three year time period, Dave, you'll see there's been a 14% increase in that three year period. 
So obviously when we're sending more trash up there, our wheel abrader expenses, when I say wheel abrader, that's wind waste innovations, that's their facility in Millbury. And we're seeing an 18% increase in our expenses. Now there's a number of reasons for that increase. One, we're sending more tons, but also next slide, would be our tipping fees are increasing. So you can see during that three year period that the tip fees, which go up every year, there's a CPI adjustment that occurs to our, to our contracted tip fee per the contract. Um, it's $71.07 now. And the hauling fee is also, this is a contracted expense that we have with a company called Commonwealth Waste Transportation. And their fees have also increased significantly. Uh, so it was 361 in FY21. Now it's 475 in FY22, 32% uh, increase in those costs. So again, snapshot, that's what we're doing with trash. Also the flip side, next slide please. The flip side would be recycling. So as we talked about, Casella Recycling is the, con is the contracted uh, uh, company that provides our recycling services, our cardboard, our paper, our coal mingle, and our single stream is sent to their Auburn facility. Again, three-year time period, look at that. We're seeing a 14% decrease in the amount of recycling that we send to Casella. So again, we're going to kind of quickly go through. Coal mingled is one of the four streams that we send up there. And over the three year period, you see, you kind of see the numbers vary. We were getting $64 a month in FY20 for commingled. Um, now we're down to, I'm sorry, we're paying $64 a month. Now we're getting $11 a month in revenue. So we, we, it, it kind of swings. And you'll see that with some of the other items as well, single stream. Uh, we were paying $65 uh, dollars, um, uh, per ton. I'm sorry, my apologies. But I'm not sure what my logic was for month. Um, oh, I know what, you know what it was? That's what the average cost was, I'm sorry. In that period of time, the average was $64 a month. But some months it was 80, some months it was 20. But it averages out for FY20 was $65 a month for single stream, uh, for FY22, $13 a month in revenue. Our cardboard, same thing, uh, $20 uh, a month, and now it's up to $112. So again, that's why I have a 460% increase uh, in cardboard revenues because it was consistent revenue growth over that period of time. And paper, again, kind of fluctuates, was $27 a month average cost in FY20. Now we're seeing revenue for our paper product. And I think that snapshot right there is kind of important because what's happening now with our with uh, consumer recycling is our most recent, what we call our price sheet, what Needham will pay or what we will, uh, we will pay for or get revenue for. We're now we're paying for commingled the single stream where over the last year we were getting revenue for it. So we're kind of back to, uh, having to pay to get rid of those items. Paper and cardboard are still a revenue stream for the community. If we look at scrap metal, we're sending a whole lot of scrap metal to our vendor in Walpole, uh, 810-69% increase over those uh, over the last three fiscal years. That's a significant shot in the yard because uh, light iron, which is what we send there, can range between $300 per, per uh, gross ton. Right now it's about 120. So there's a lot of fluctuations in the market, but it provides a good revenue stream to the community. Mattresses, uh, again, we, we talked about this just a minute ago about the Department of Environmental Protection's waistbands. Starting November 1st, mattresses will be a waistband item, so you can no longer throw those away into the trash, and we've got a program in place now to, uh, to make sure that uh, all mattresses are recycled. And we're seeing a significant increase, significant increase in the number of mattresses that we are recycling at the transfer station. Again, you can see almost 800, 800 mattresses uh, in FY22. And lastly, food waste. Um, we began the program in FY21, 17 tons, uh, 72 tons in FY22 for a total of 89 tons so far. Really happy with the program, looking to make that grow. Um, Quick question on this one. Yeah. So in general, across all of the recycling categories, yep. it's we're making more than we were before, right? Yeah. So, so what's happening right now, FY, FY23, uh, FY22 is a really, really good year for Needham with regard to our recyclables because our recycling program while there's revenue associated with sending those four commodities, as I refer to them, to Auburn under the contract, we have to pay to have those hauled out by our Commonwealth Waste Transportation contract. So there's a cost associated with every trailer that goes to Auburn. However, the revenues from the, the commodities going to Auburn offsets the hauling cost. So we're still in the black with regard to our recycling program. Okay, now if we look at FY23, and if I kind of, if I, if I try to put on my crystal ball and think about the rest of FY23, I think where the market's going, and I spend a lot of time talking with the seller recycling staff about this, 
we will be, we need them, we'll be paying for that service in the very near future. Right now we're about breaking even because we're still getting revenue from our cardboard and our paper, but we are paying for our single stream and our co mingle Okay, so we're, we're, we're teetering on still being in the black, very soon we'll be in the red for sure. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We can talk about that if you're interested, but that's just a snapshot of kind of what. I never thought we'd see uh, things turn back to revenue in the streams when they you know, turn to the cost centers. Yeah, we FY22 was a really good year. <laughs> really good year. Yeah. Crazy, huh? The, but it, it's, just, it's just the nature. And I think this is one of the challenges that a lot of communities have is they become addicted to these, these revenues. And, and, I, and I'm all, I'm, you know, it's great to work for a town like Nina that doesn't kind of look at it that way. We always have purchase orders set up to pay for the service. We're prepared for these things. Other communities may not be. And so we're insulated from, from the ups and downs of, of the market, but it's, it's, you have to be really careful about that. I, I never really look at these as true revenues. It's, it's the cost of doing business. I always want to have purchase orders in place in the event that the market changes, which it will do. Can you, just a quick question, can you share what the increase was on the cardboard year over the, the actual tonnage? And the reason I ask that is it because obviously in 2021, we were all taking in a whole lot of Amazon boxes and it's more curiosity. I can certainly get those figures. I don't have them uh, memorized or, or, or uh, actually, do I have them with me right now? Same way. Um, but um, yeah, so, so our cardboard numbers are strong. Uh, we bring in a lot of cardboard, obviously both from contractors and from residents. And um, let me see if I have that handy real quick here. And again, it's for curiosity, so we, we can just take it offline. But I got to imagine that a lot of us also have subscriptions for dog food or whatever that's coming in boxes that that's not going to diminish anytime soon. I, I don't have access to the network, unfortunately, from here. But but you know, next time I'd love to share that with you. But it's a great point. You know, we are, we're, we're, we've, because we're, we're the Amazon generation, we're seeing tons and tons of cardboard come to the transfer station. It's, it has been historically a road shot in the arm revenue wise. I don't really see cardboard. Cardboard for many, many years has always been a revenue stream. The, the ones that are a little more tenuous are paper, commingled and single stream. And if you don't know what single stream is, basically it's the, the contractors that pick up curbside who instead of separating paper from cardboard, or paper from from your glass and plastics and tin cans, you put it all into one container. They bring it to the transfer station. They dump it into a into a large forty yard container, and it's we call that single stream. Single stream is commingled paper and cardboard all in one lump sum. And again, there's there's a lot of costs associated with that, with kind of culling that all out in Auburn at Casella's facility, which is why they charge us for that. Bill, you look like you have a question. No, no, I'll say thank you. Hey, you have that look on your face. I was getting ready. Um, so that's that's largely uh, my presentation for this evening. Uh, just again, I, I like kind of giving you all a snapshot of what's going on out there. But I think the most imminent thing was just getting the fee structure uh, amended so we can move on that out there. Okay. One last question, because you mentioned Cassell. Um, do we have a sense of how many houses have decided to, and I know this is, you know, a delicate topic, but can we infer anything based on the on the single stream relative to how many houses are electing to have curbside? It's a, it's a challenge for me to know um, how many communities have curbside in, in the in the town. I think there's always been a general understanding that the town is basically split down the middle. About half of the households come to the transportation, the other half have some kind of curbside. And there's, there are two ways that you can, well, there's actually more than two, but I guess two of the easiest are to look at traffic counts and try to use traffic counts as an indicator of how many um, households are utilizing the transfer station. And so we've been doing traffic counts twice a year. We do them in May and October at the RTS. We do them for a two week period. We basically break those numbers down and we try to get a sense of how many households are utilizing the transfer station. And it's, so I look at those every, every year and we're, we're not seeing a decrease or a decline in the number of households that are coming to Needham. But, but all you have to do is drive around Needham every day, which I do, 
And you see that there were more and more of these orifice type, you know, barrels at, at the edge of people's driveways. So I'm not really sure what's going on. We're not seeing a decrease in, in traffic at the transfer station. We're not seeing a significant, you know, uh, uh, decrease in the amount of material. We're seeing a little bit less recycling coming in. Um, so I'm really, really not sure where we are. Are we at 60, 40 or 55, 45 or 50, 50? I'm not really sure. But we're not seeing a significant reduction in patronage at the airports. I think the, the other way to look at it is how many people are opting to get stickers or not. Right, and we talked about that during the last meeting. We, we did. How many and, households? And, yeah. I'm sorry, Jeff. And, and, and so, when, so when I said there are two ways, one of the other ways would be to track stickers. But what we don't have is we don't have a program in place right now where we're asking residents to, um, to update their sticker annually or every other year. So we can't use stickers as an indicator of, um, or just of we actual can't households. Easily use yep. stickers to kind of track how many households are utilizing. If we if we went if, if we did if we did what I would like to see done if we did have people have to update their stickers every year or every other year it would certainly help us in trying to determine what I call patronage levels. Yeah. From an environmental perspective, though, the recycling that comes in from these third parties like Orifice is lower quality. So what comes in where? The single stream. They bring it in single stream, right? Or do they no. separate it? Yeah. So so. So anybody like like Orifice or any you know Republic Waste Management, anybody who's going to a household is not bringing their materials to the transfer station. The single stream that we do see is from one contractor. It's Timmerman, John Timmerman, a local uh, a gentleman in town here, and he does pick up curbside from households, and he brings single stream into the RTS and tips it into this one container. So we're not seeing a lot of single stream. Uh, most of what we do see from the contractors is either bulky waste, cardboard, paper. No, single stream does not include trash. They have to separate the recycle. The, the yes, yeah, so, so single stream is recyclable. So yes, there will be no trash. In, or there should not be any trash. In. Right. But it's mixed. Well, I've, at least what I've heard, and I can't remember who this was from. I think it was from well, hopefully when I went to visit there, was that the single stream, essentially much of it ends up as trash. It's like higher quality trash than the other trash. No, I, I, take, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Because no. I think when, when you talk about single stream ending up as trash, it's, it's either a recyclable or it's, or it's so laced with, with waste and it becomes, it becomes trash. But now, the, the, um, what's high quality trash versus low quality trash? Well, well, uh, so, what you, well so, yeah, so, so batteries, right? Like, so there's lots of stuff that people put in the trash, um, but I'm talking about contamination, right? So if you're putting bottles, uh, some of which are opened and you know, some of which are half, you know, beer cans that have had a beer or, you know, wine that stuff is all pouring together and that's what i understood was there was quite a lot more contamination uh and it was harder to separate that stuff uh, so that was what I, I heard yeah and i think that's fair you know you, you what you're going to see in single stream um single single stream is a, is a is a process that's designed to make recycling super easy but the the, the challenge with single stream <coughs> makes people super lazy and so what you tend to get is for a town like wellesley that has, uh, has a long-term, very, very precise recycling process where people are calling out bluegrass from red grass from green grass from clear grass from brown. I mean, it's amazing what people in Wellesley will do because they've been you know, kind of indoctrinated into this program over many, many years. But single stream allows communities to get high rates of recycling. But the, the, the offset to that is that it's not very high quality recycling because people throw everything in but the kitchen sink into that into that mix, which is why you tend to pay a whole lot of money when your recycling program is solely single stream because the companies that are taking it, one, they reckon there's gonna be a lot of trash in it, and two, the recycling costs, or the, the separation costs are so high. So the private haulers, they have two barrels, mm -hmm. one for the single stream recycling of everything and one for trash. Is that how it works? For Timmerman, who's collecting, yes, he's, he's not doing, so he's not separating cardboard. He's basically coming in and he, and he might, he, I, I'd have to look at his operation because I'm, I'm, my job doesn't require me to do this really, really closely. I'm not sure if he's bringing in scrap metal. I think he does. But he brings in trash, single stream, and he might be segregating out scrap metal before I go through this. And, yeah. Interestingly enough, to, to my previous question about, you know, decreases, and he was, Terran was my supplier 
uh, for the longest time until he decreased basically how much of the uh, of the town he was covering, right? And I don't know if that was due to just general lack of business or, or what was going on, but that would be an interesting data point to to go back to Timmerman and see what their increase or decrease in business has been. Yeah, I, I know that that Jeff has had made a business business decision to not have as many routes. I don't know what his motivation was. I, I've never asked him that. Greg, have we ever, there's a town survey that comes out every uh, January from the, um, I don't know if it's from the treasurer's office or from the town hall, think, and ask you things about like dog uh, licenses and, and number of people living in the house. Did we ever consider putting a question on there asking residents if they're using the, the RTS or not, or, or curbside pickup and using that as a method to gather data on um, the usage in the town? If, uh, Bill, <clears throat> something like that would be a great idea, but specifically that's uh, associated with uh, the voter rolls and, and that's uh, um, uh, regulated by the state. And all it can ask you is uh, name, date of birth, occupation, and if you have dogs and mm -hmm. you need them registered, you can't ask anything else. Okay. You know, I mean, I, you know, the town could even do a survey if the town wanted to, like a mail survey or, or, or something. But I think the challenge is that, you know, the, the RTS, you could ask someone, do they come to the RTS? Um, people would come to the RTS. They might, they might come to the RTS to just do organic recycling, meaning brush and leaves and grass, or they might just come to drop off their food waste, or they might just come to drop off their trash. It, it, it's kind of hard to try and elicit what people are coming to the RTS for, because we provide so many services and that residents may come just for one small subset of that service that they can't get curbside. Um, so I, I think, you know, if we were to do a survey and say, if you come to the RTS, you'd probably get 80% of the community saying yes, but is that really representative of what we want to know? Because I think if really the question is, and I think, you know, there is, there is a, there, uh, my understanding is the town is going to be bringing a consultant on to start evaluating the, or trying to gauge the community's interest in curbside, some kind of a curbside collection program, or do we kind of continue on doing what we're doing now at the RTS? But, it, but uh, you know, just asking residents, hey, are you using the RTS? You might have 90% of the community saying, yes, we do, but that's not really representative of what I think the town really wants to know. And that, 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 that does lead us into a question that was asked about, can, can we ask for uh, updates on where we are with the, the, the two studies um, that were, asked for by town meeting. So what two studies? Were well, one made? was you, one you just referenced, right? There's a study to ask about. Uh, we haven't even issued the RFP on that yet. Um, hopefully <clears throat> this fall, um, we'll have the RFP and have a consultant probably by the beginning of the year would be my guess. That sounds, sounds reasonable to me. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know much about it. I'm not. I'm not. I haven't been involved in in, in, in that, any aspect. That, that. That's driven more by the select board than uh, DPW just administratively is handling. But the study itself is driven by the select board. Now there were two, right? There was one about the, uh, the uh, looking at the operations of the uh, of, of the transfer station, right? Uh, the, um, before I think that had to do with the in which the capital investment to deal with the stormwater and the uh, moving around of the, of the um, organics. It was what you relied upon in, in terms of the capital plan that to deal with the stormwater runoff, to deal with the new trailer. So it's gotta be about five years ago. There's oh, companies- oh, that, 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 that the Unomia study? Yes. That was the, um, yes, yeah, so that was what we called it, like the efficiency study. And that, but that was done. Yeah, it was. Um, there were, but there were two on this this past town, this past town meeting. There were two parking study. There's a study for uh, look at parking in the downtown business district in the Needham Heights business district, and that's actually um, um, out on the street now. We just uh, received uh, several proposals. The um, 
there was a question around the operation uh, at the transfer station around uh, before spending money on the, the tip, uh, uh, you know, the regards. That's what uh, Greg and I were just referring okay. to. Yeah, yeah, it's fifty thousand dollar right expenditure. Yeah. And then there was the other one around oh, the, the DPW, uh, the uh, DPW facility. There's a study of that is in terms of uh, looking at do we keep everything in one location? Do we use satellites? But uh, that's not specific to the recycling transfer okay. station. That's DPW and its entire operation and looking out. Uh, and what that's going out to bid for a private. I would hope that Greg would be involved in that. Too. Well, a any, mm -hmm. um, any um, study that involves any department, obviously the department head division head would be involved. Um, and I said that the uh, Can, or the RTS yeah. study. We have do, many studies out there right now. Do we happen to, uh, do we rent those meters, the thing that goes across that you drive over with your car? For traffic counts? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so those, uh, the, those, those hoses, those black hoses are actually the property of the engineering department. And so okay. no, we don't, they, they've actually purchased those and that's their equipment. So, so the reason I ask that is it would be really interesting from a data point perspective, we were talking a, a few minutes ago about, you know, what is the usage? It would, I'd be really curious to see how many people are just coming to do their leaves versus actually recycle. Yeah, so, and Jeff, great question. We, we've actually thought of that. So what we do is we, the traffic counts, the, the traffic counting devices are set at strategic places where we can look at the total number of people entering the facility. And then we can look at the number of people who are actually bypassing our gates and going right down to the yard waste area. So we get that number as part of the total. And then we get the number who are coming into the gates. It's not a truly representative figure of who's using the RTS for trash and recycling and who is using the RTS for organics, because a lot of people come in and they use the drop-off walls for trash recycling, and then they go to the organic storage. So it's not a true representative number, but it does kind of help us get a general sense of the split, and the split is about 80-20. I would imagine that there's a good chunk of that 80. So I, I'm one of the people, the 80, that yeah. um, frequently does both. But when I go in, I, I drop off my food yeah. and then my recycling, and the trash, and then I go to the organics. Right. So it's more efficient. And yeah. uh, so the RFP, um, who's involved in writing, like writing that RFP? Oh, that's that. staff. S staff. People like me, people like Greg, people like the DPW director. So that, I mean, I guess that, I, I know we, one of the questions was how might the, committee be involved in the study itself, but I don't know if it could be interesting to have us be able to review that. We would, uh, well, that because you'd be getting inside information of procurement and that you're not bound to keep the information secret from vendors. So the procurement process very- Oh, I see, I see, I see. It's, so it could, the it's procurement process, process could get contaminated. Yes. I got it. Got but, it. Uh, but getting to the point that you're looking at, it would be the intent, one piece of uh, the study to also meet with and talk with the boards, um, uh, uh, the Salt Waste Advisory Committee, uh, just like the parking study uh, will be speaking with the planning board and the Council of Economic uh, Advisors. That, that's, that is pro forma uh, for um, uh, committees that would have a, um, uh, a that have an, a role in the process uh, of the study. So yes, uh, that would be included. So, so Wells, we we are an advisory committee. So you know our our, our role is sort of to be, is to um, advocate for the the feel of the feelings of the community, right? But we're not we're not involved in management. We can be. And we have been. We know we, we're not. Uh, yeah, and I, we're, I've we're, actually we're... helped out with the science at the RFP at the uh, RTS. 
So I think we can get as a volunteer, yes, as a volunteer, right. as a as, as a as knowledgeable a, as, as a right? cit as a citizen of, of Needham. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're 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 taking that on. Okay. But but this is an advisory committee, and it will not get involved in in micromanaging because the staff the staff are the ones who will have to be held accountable. It's not about micromanaging. It's about offering feedback, and that's what we do. We offer feedback. Exactly. Yes. So my suggestion was that we could offer feedback in this process. Right. <clears throat> um, so are, are, we, are we up to date? We covered the, um, on the, <clears throat> your um, the, the uh, waste ban. So that was covered in your narrative, um, right? Or did you set aside a, a separate uh, agenda item specifically to speak to at that? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think my only message about the waste bans was that um, you know, the Department of Environmental Protection has a series of waste bans that the RTS has been in compliance with for years, paper, cardboard, scrap metal, so on. And now these two new waste bans, that is mattresses and textiles, uh, that ban will go into post November 1st. We've got new signage, we've got all new protocols. Uh, we've talked to all of our contractors, you know, we're well prepared for November 1st. Um, and, but, and I just try to stress that, you know, you know, need them. Uh, you know, I, I work very hard to make sure that we're well in advance of, of bands that are coming down the pike so that we don't have to suffer the shock of, oh my God, we have to scramble and have bands in place. And so we're, I get, I think the message just is that we're in a good place to be fully compliant come November 1st. I have one more question about the discussion we just had about the uh, study um, and just understanding the curbside changes. Because what I heard was that. Uh, Orifice and all the vendors don't do single stream recycling, they only do trash. Um, if we were to move to curbside, would we, or maybe as this is up for discussion, but would we, would the idea be that we would shut down both the trash and the recycling aspects of the RTS? And that whatever vendor did curbside would do single stream and trash? Or was the idea that it could potentially be where the curbside just as trash will be stay open with the recycling? Nothing has been pre-supposed. Uh, all those questions will be. It, it, it's looking at all those. Um, now, commu communities uh, that do have uh, curbside pickup uh, still offer um, a recycling center uh, it's limited hours, but they still offer that. The other reality is if the town were to just say, okay, we're, we're a curbside community, the town itself still has a lot of activity. The town still, and the residents still have to have a place to bring their leaves, the grass, the brush. So uh, that facility is still going to exist and there's still gonna be a demand. It really is uh, looking at um, should the town continue with the model it has? Should it modify the model? Or should it uh, just uh, uh, leave residential choice uh, to uh, uh, the residents disposing with private contractors, um, their trash and their recycling? Do they look at a model where the town itself makes the capital investment in the equipment and pick up at the curbside? So as I said, nothing is presupposed that we want to hear. Um, all, all different uh, concepts. Yeah, and, and I think one of the other things is, is Dave, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I heard that there may be a sub, uh, maybe a evaluation of hours in the RTS as well, looking at hours and you know, days it's open and so on. So I think that might may be part of the discussion for this consultant as they, as they kind of venture down this road of, of possible curbside, some hybrid way. But Chip, Greg, for a point of clarification, the private haulers have to separate the recyclables. They can't. They just they can't have everybody throw throw their recyclables and their trash in one bin. Um, so there, that would you would you would that would be they would be non-compliant. You would uh, oppose that. But we could have an option where they just pick up the trash, but people still have to go to the RTS to recycle. That was more of what we were thinking. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if 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 the if a, if a contractor wanted to provide curbside recycling service, certainly they could have a single stream option. Yeah, the truck would just- but they, can't, they, they can't bring um, the recycling, you know, uh, 
um, trash and recycling altogether? Yes. No, no, no. So there, no, certainly you would have to have, whether it was one truck at a time, they sell trucks that have split bays where you put your single stream on one side and your trash on the other, and they go on to the next house and all the way down, or you just have one truck that picks up single stream and the next pick, picks up trash. You know, there's all kinds of ways to do it, but no, I think. Or, or even alternate. You could even alternate days. You're, you know, your recycling is Wednesdays and your, your trash is Monday. Yep, yep. I, I just, just to build on Dave's point, I think the, the one thing that I think, and this will be talked about ad nauseum, I'm sure, as part of hearings and all these other things when a consultant is brought on board, is that the transfer station provides a full suite of services that you cannot get curbside. You cannot recycle waste oil and antifreeze at the curbside. You can't recycle fluorescent light tubes. You can't recycle gasoline. Well, I suppose you could. It would be very expensive. There's all kinds of that items that the state DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, says you must recycle that cannot easily or economically be done curbside. That you would so so the art. If people are thinking, oh, we can shut the RTS down, which I would be sad to see. Um, you, it's not a feasible alternative. Matter of fact, it's not even an alternative at all. There will be an RTS. It it just may not handle trash and and, and those those paper, cardboard, commingled, and, and single stream items would no longer be coming there if the town just said no. We're not gonna, we're going to ship that to a curbside, but there would still be a sizable presence at the at the RTS to handle all that other material. Okay, so I think we've covered everything. Um, David, uh, this might be your opportunity to bring things up. I don't know if, any, if all questions have been answered before we move on to you know, bringing. That was the other questions. one that I mentioned to you uh, on the email. Was, I thought we covered it. Uh, About the excess capacity at the uh, RTS for potentially bringing external uh, more. Uh, so I do mean to just ask a question. Yes, why don't you do that? Um, but no, I think I, it was answered so it's, it's somewhat in some of the future discussions with studies and, and, and sort of that. But, uh, Could be, yeah, maybe it's the same thing. Um, but no, I remember a while back, uh, Greg mentioned that we potentially could have excess capacity at the RTS and could potentially bring in revenue for the town if we were to, uh, you know, uh, allow other towns or, uh, or other, uh, private vendors to bring their trash. Um, you know, obviously there would be lots of questions and pros and cons about that kind of a discussion, but just wondering if that's something that, um, has there been any more discussion about that or any other thoughts? Well, uh, I mean, I'll just kind of pick up where, where I think we maybe we left off or how what we briefly touched on. And I'll try to keep it brief, but in case you don't know, the transfer station is governed by a number of permits, Board of Health permits, uh, uh, we, have a, we have a site assignment with a special permit, I should say, with the planning board. But probably one of the most important permits is with the Department of Environmental Protection. And we have a permit that says that we cannot handle any more than 200 tons per day of, of material coming into the facility, which is, which is comprised of leaves, brush, grass, waste oil, scrap metal, trash, all recyclables. So one of the things that I need to understand is on, an, on a daily basis, how much material are we handling on average during our low season and our high season? Because we see all we see a whole lot more waste in you know in September than we do in January. On average, we're seeing about 50 tons per waste come in per day. And yet we're permitted for 200 tons per day. So I, I think maybe what you maybe the, the issue is if we have 150 tons of capacity, what does that mean? Well, I think it, it means it means hmm, that's interesting, and it provides the community with options to consider. Now, I'm sure this is not the first time I've made note of this. In fact, I'm sure I've probably said this a couple of times in the past. For those who don't know, right now the commercial tip fee for waste coming into the transfer station is $140 per ton. My staff has gone through and we've done the valuation of our of our of comparable facilities like the RTS, whether it's publicly held or privately held, and gauged what those tip fees are. Needham is way below what the average tip fee is for handling a bulky commercial trash. So if we're at, if we have $150 of excess capacity, and if we wanted to look at the transfer station and say, what can we do to maybe 
to take what I would refer to as an underutilized asset and better utilize that asset, maybe we would want to think about would we want to accept out of network, this is not the first time I've used this term with this committee, but out of network waste at a hypothetical $200 chip fee, which would be about in between where our higher uh, uh, facilities are that are out there and it would be above where we are right now at 140. And if we wanted to say, well, okay, let, let's just allow $50, or 50 tons per day of wasting. And then what would that mean for traffic on Central Avenue? Probably an additional 20 trucks per day coming into the transfer station, run the numbers on, on in my, my, the quick math in my head, it would be about $100,500,000 in additional revenue to the town. So, you know, there's, that, that's a very, very, that's a, that's a two minute spinoff on what could the RTS do given that we're well below what our permitting capacity is. But there's all kinds of political challenges and discussions that have to be had, you know, and what are the, what, what are the infrastructure changes that would need to be made at the RTS, the staffing level is adequate, you know, it just, it just opened up Pandora's box and a whole bunch of issues to consider. But I think to answer your question, Wells, there is, and I, I've, I've suspected for a long time, I know now that the RTS is, is kind of an underutilized uh, asset. And the, the question far above my pay grade is, um, do we want to do something more than we can? Because I think that there is, there, if, if, we, if you want to look at the RTS as a possible revenue generating facility, and there may be some in the town who are interested in that, there may be others who are not interested in that, but there's a, there are opportunities, in my opinion. And like gut feeling, would you say that this would be a fundamental, like if we did these 20 extra trucks a day, would that be a fundamental change in the operations or kind of like an adjustment to the operations? And just a ballpark, hypothetically. I think a question like that really depends on who you ask. Um, if you ask me, I think that safety is always number one to the community, whether it's me managing the facility or people who are responsible for managing traffic levels on roads. So safety is always number one and you have to evaluate what the community's appetite is for, for, for increasing traffic on a roadway and how that kind of, what is the appetites, what is the community's appetite for those additional trips? There may be some who say it makes the roads unsafe or maybe others who say, who say it's not. I think the RTS, um, we could go through a very thorough evaluation looking at our infrastructure, looking at our hours, looking at our queuing capacities, looking at our tip floor, looking at the investments that need to be made to the infrastructure. And I think 20 additional trucks could be done. Can I ask a question though around, around those 20 trucks? Wouldn't we be in a position where maybe they run between five and 7 a.m. or maybe they run between five and 7 p.m. So there, there could be some staggering I have to imagine that that could offset some of that traffic. And Jeff, that's a great point. And, you know, it's, um, you know, one of the challenges that any facility like the, like, like the RTS has is that you usually have contractors who are lining up at the gate first thing in the morning at 7 a.m. or 7.30. They've been out on the road since 5 a.m. and they're looking to tip so they can kind of continue on with their day. You know, we, we can't have, you know, 40 trucks lining up at the gate along with all the residential traffic because it just results in oh okay. I, i'm sorry i i got confused between the trucks that were going to take the material away and the trucks that are bringing the material in and well the trucks that take it away take it away early early in the morning so they wouldn't be part of this the, the, this okay but i think yep. what, I'm, what i'm saying is i'm agreeing with you when i'm just saying that one of the ways to handle our our, our current commercial uh, vendors who come in and possibly any future would be you could simply stagger the permit. You could say, okay, well, we're going to issue this permit with, with the understanding that your company cannot come in anytime before 9:30, and you have to be out of here before 3 30 in the afternoon. And if your if your business can work with us on that, that's one way to minimize you know, impacts to Central Avenue when traffic levels tend to be high first thing in the morning and during commutes in the afternoon. So there, there's ways to to through the permit that the town would issue to an out of network vendor to say, you have to agree with this in order for us to, to issue you the permit. And that's what, that's how you structure the incoming material. So I think we're getting a little far ahead of ourselves, but, but I, but I just wanted to kind of try to answer Wells' question that, you know, we, we, we have additional capacity at the transfer station. 
But I think that this one of the more, one of the more fundamental questions that I think you have to have answered is: Is there an appetite in the community to want to, to want to have the RTS serve <clears throat> out of network, out of Needham's trash? Do you want to bring that here, even though it, it and use the RTS as a revenue stream? And that's where this committee it will be. You know, it, it is it is designed to have input. And I you know right yeah. in, in that. You know, the, there are simple decisions around revenue. Yeah, let's uh, let's open it up and bring in all you know twenty trucks a day. That's three an hour. You know, but as we open it up for the community, how does the community feel about that? The increased traffic and, and the safety. You know, there are going to be a lot of people. You know, there are going to be some people who say, you know, we want as much revenue as possible, so it doesn't cost us money. I don't care. And there are going to be a lot of people saying, you know, I don't want that on the traffic. I don't want to go through the center of town. And there's neighborhoods uh, there um, as well. And it's our committee to survey, you know, sort of those feelings and what uh, what's the uh, tolerance, um, you know, of the community in regards to making those sort of revenue business decisions as well. And I agree, Jeff. And I think that, you know, this particular question right now is, is really, really timely in my mind, especially when you think about some of the things we talked about just an hour ago with regards to like the Millbury Consortium or the, D, the 2030 Master Plan. There's a lot of things that are going on both in Needham with the $50,000 study that Dave talked about. We're going to go for bid. We're going to bring a consultant in to talk about curbside. But I think there, you know, there's, there, there were offshoots associated with that conversation. And I think as, as I'm kind of listening to myself, I'm listening to Wells, I'm listening to you, and I'm kind of listening to my own thoughts here, is that that process may take a year, it may take two years, whatever it takes, but a decision will be made. And if, this, if the decision is made to say, no, we, 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 the community doesn't want to go with curbside right now, we want to continue doing our own thing, then the question will be, okay, so we're going to, we're going to continue with the RTS. There's going to have to be... A, um, there's going to have to be investments made to the RTS. It's a 30-year-old facility. It's it's really kind of showing its age. However, it, at the same time, you know, a discussion could be had over the next couple of years to say there may be an opportunity to utilize the RTS above and beyond what we're doing now. So you have those discussions now, so that when the consultant study is done, the decision is made to go ahead and continue business as usual. We're in a position to be able to say that the community has kind of given, kicked the tires on the idea of increasing its throughput to utilize the RTS as a revenue stream. And now we know that we're going to have to make investments to make that a reality. So it's, I, I think these kind of discussions are prudent to have now because there is a connection. There, at some point, there will be a connection how, how these two discussions intersect. And, and the, the, the town is going to have to is going to have to say in order to make this a reality, we have to make X investments. So I, I see them. I, I don't see any of these as kind of just being separate. They're all intertwined. They all they all connect in and maybe at different times, but but I do I do see that they do they do connect. I mean, it just seems to me uh, like at least it seems like it's worth a discussion just from what we've said, because it's 1.5 million. I mean, I'm not the one to decide the pros and cons, right? It's the community, but 1.5 million in the budget. And I think that you said that that's income, not revenue, right? That's, that's yeah, after. Yeah, right. So, you, you know, so, so the way to think about that would be if you're, if it's, I don't think I really went there with the discussion, but it would be. It would be approximately, and I have to go back and, and fine tune the numbers. It's probably like around eighty-five dollars a ton. I just I just worked on this a few weeks ago, looking at what our TIF fee costs are and what our transportation costs are per ton, and it's about eighty-two to eighty-five dollars per ton to tip and transport a ton of trash at Wynn in Millbury. So if your commercial TIF fee out of network fee is is two hundred dollars per ton you know that $85 is going to have to go to covering the expense to burn and transport that. So the rest of it, the 115 per ton, is income to the community. So if you do the math on it, if you're doing 50 tons per, per day times 5, 250 times 52, is my math isn't that good, whatever it is, and multiply that by $115, it's, it, could be, it could be a million you know, and change. And then the other thing that uh, Jeff said is, 
uh, the other on, online was that if we could uh, restrict the hours to time that there's low traffic, that that seems to help at least the idea. Like I, I wouldn't want to even consider this if it was everybody going to be coming at rush hour when all the kids are walking to school. But if we could do it when there's not really many cars on the road. So anyway, it just seems like an interesting, I mean, it seems interesting to a conversation to have. I don't know who, who talks about these things, who, uh, yeah, you know, but it does certainly does seem like. Well, I think that we've, you know, for, for, for all the years um, that, that, that Greg has been in, in his position, um, he has presented us with, um, you know, a, a vision and anticipation uh, of, of issues. And he, is, he has presented us with information and made predictions that have come true. And I, I think we can feel confident in you know the, the management that those decisions will be made. And I think you just said, you know, I mean these are studies here and there's a lot of people who are who who are scrutinizing and want you know um you know the, the, the most revenue that, that they can you know or, or uh, as well and you know I, I think we're looking at the big picture you know and I think that you know I, I think we can feel confident in the DPW uh management uh uh, uh and, and anticipation of and, and the, the future and how much this has changed in the, in the, in, in the last you know seven years it, it, it's incredible and you know and, and we've been in a good Needham's been in a good place because of that so I think we can feel confident about that and that we'll look at everything and when these discussions happen you know we'll talk about that I got the sense I wasn't sure maybe I was off but I got the sense Greg you were so you were thinking this is a good time to have the discussion who is that something that you'll then just uh, take and drive or who yeah, you know, I, I think the thing about a discussion like this is that, yeah, you know, I, I work for the director of public works, and so I certainly want the, the director to be at least aware of this little discussion we're having now and try to gauge, you know, because, because you know, Karis Lustig as the director is, you know, she's looking at the kind of the political end of this and, and so on, and I'm looking at it from the operations point of view and, and, and you know, kind of safety and, and money and all that sort of thing. So I certainly want to make sure the director was kind of in, in agreement about the idea of, of beginning to explore this. But I think, I think one of my responsibilities as a superintendent there is to provide information. And just like you said, Jeff, you know, I'm a planner by trade and I'm always kind of looking at the future and, you know, and, but I look at the, I look at the RTS as not just a, a place to bring, to, to bring trash and recycling, like, like I think the residents do, but I'm looking at it more from the point of view of, of it's an asset to the community and, it, and it's an underutilized asset. The, the question for the committee, the question for the community is, what does that mean? You know, I, 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 can, I can pose it and say, there are options here for the community to consider, but then the community has to run with that and say, we're not interested in that at all, or hey, that's tantalizing, let's evaluate further. I cannot begin to evaluate further unless I have a signal from the community to say, this is something that that appeals to us, you know. And, and again, I also would want to have the director's kind of concurrence on on my time being spent that way. So that's kind of where we are with that. Can I? I guess I do have a question. After we've reviewed what we have, we talked about brick and stone. Is there? Is that still in the plan? Do you recall that from the last meeting? You, you might mean rock and block? Is that what you mean? The bay, um, was there a bay? No, we had talked about brick, having a, a brick and, and stone disposal area. Yeah, so that, <laughs> that's what we refer to as rock and block. So that the, the program was called rock and block. And what that is, is uh, residents who, you know, maybe tear up their patio and have a bunch of brick and concrete and stone, and they want to dispose of it. The rock and block program that we had for many years was a place to bring that. The challenge is that the, the RTS when I was hired was just a fairly disorganized massive piles of debris. And the rock and block was collected by the residents just tossed into these errant piles out there that made no sense and had no home. So we spent a lot of money and time over the last five, six, seven years cleaning up the RTS and getting it to <coughs> what it looks like today. One of the decisions that we made was because we didn't have a place to bring concrete or brick or stone was to just 
stop the program. And we did provide residents with information about where else they could bring this. They could bring it to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, White right down the road. There's a few other companies they could bring it to. Residents are still dropping the material off, and it's made me think that we have to we have to revisit reinstituting the program. The challenge that we have is if we reinstitute the program, we have to have a place where this material can be recycled. And it's very challenging. So um, it's on my agenda to get this figured out, but it's very challenging to figure out. And I'm not wanting to just start a program without, without having it well thought through so that we don't just end up with another disorganized mess. I'm, I'm loath to returning to that out there. So kind of a long-winded response. It's on the, it, it's, it's something I've talked with about, talked with, uh, I've talked about the issue to my staff. And just, to, just because we're talking about it, just so you know, the RTS, as large as it is, is actually very short on spare space. And when I talk about spare space, you cannot have a successful rock and block or brick concrete stone recycling program out of the eye of the people who are watching this. And so what that means is we have to try to find site by our office trailer to locate this program. And we have very, very little <coughs> site there under our present configuration. So uh, I have done a plan for the RTS that if we decide not to go with curbside, how the RTS could morph into a 21st century facility with investment from the community. Part of that investment would be in, in increasing the amount of space that we have for materials that need to be managed with consistent oversight and rock and block would be included in this revamped area. So a lot more information than you were probably looking for, but I, I don't tend to just wade into these programs without thinking everything through. We're not there yet. What's the contamination that you're worried about from rock and block? We see all kinds of junk that gets thrown in here. People throw, people throw any kind of construction debris they can think of in these, in these uh, well, in the area where we had it years ago, when I was hired, I just, just people were throwing kitchen sinks and toilets and all kinds of construction debris in these, in these areas. And we just end up with a bunch of junk that we had no place to bring it. So I, I quickly put a stop to that. And, you know, we, and you know, the thing is, we don't tend to see huge amounts of this. We, you know, we do see some brick come in. We do see some rock come in. Uh, we are allowed to put trace amounts of that in the trash. We don't like to publicize that, but we can put trace amounts of this material into the trash. Um, but I think, I think we're just trying to stress the point of, I'm aware of it. We, we, we have had discussions, but I'm not prepared to reconstitute a program without knowing that I've got places to bring this material. And it's very challenging to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so David, you're on. So I um, visited BJ's the other day in Dedham. And I know that when I go there, I often see Needham residents. So it does have something to do with Needham. And what I, um, among other things, um, what I do at BJ's is many times I buy like a case of beer, especially if I'm entertaining at home. I don't drink that much myself, but, but you know, I, 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 um, I, I, I get a case of beer. And the thing is that the question is what to do with the bottles when, I, when the beer has been consumed. So I was, since I go to BJ's for other reasons, I would take these bottles back to BJ's and I would, um, they have machines there that um, take the cans and bottles and, and um, you get a receipt. I think everybody here probably knows how this works. You get a receipt and, and you get, you know, you get, you get the money that you already paid for the, for the cans and bottles. Fine. So this How, is relevant to us, David? Yes, I'll get to the point. Okay. 
So I, um, uh, so, so I brought some, um, some bottles um, back to BJ's and I, the other day, and I noticed they have a new policy. And their policy is in the past, if for example, the machine wasn't working or it wasn't working properly or whatever, they, they or was full or what, whatever the case, that it couldn't be used, that they would take at the counter, they would take the, they would take the bottles. Now they won't do that. They're saying it either goes in the machine or we don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm not even sure this is legal. I mean, because I think, I don't know, if, but if some, anybody else in the committee has an idea about this, but I think that, that if they sell the bottles or cans, they should have to, re, they should have to re, you know, participate in the recycling. Um, even for example, Trader Joe's, which does not have, as far as I know, any machines, they will take the, they will physically take the cans and bottles off your hands if you go there and talk loud enough. Anyway, I just wondered if anybody in the, um, the committee had to, had any idea about about this. So uh, I have one input on that. And the requirement is that it has to be a brand that they actually sell. Of course. So they're that, not that, obligated. Yeah, but they're not obligated if it's brand XYZ and they don't happen to sell that. I, they're not I obligated. That. To I understand yeah. that. But they, they, I, I got to say, we, we could talk about this and all that and this regulations, but it's not within the context of, of our committee. And, and, and I, I mean, if you want to, you know, if you want to drop them off at the you know the transfer station, there's a really convenient uh, thing there right by uh, the 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 the, uh, the bottle bin that uh, I stopped. I stopped trying to take my bottles for the the the, uh, the, the deposits because yeah, you know I have been to the liquor store. You go to the liquor store, Upper Falls Liquor. You go there, you bring your you know your eight cases of beer, and you go there, and all of a sudden they're going. They're taking out the one that we don't sell this. We don't sell this, and you you know now you have to you're walking out with a, like another two six packs, and it's like I don't even want it. You can't you just take them and not give me the deposit? And they're like, no, no, you got to carry it out of here. So you know, now I got to go to you know to, to the transfer station. So I, I just put them there, and I stopped, I, and I donate my five cents a bottle, um, and I hope the dean gets a revenue for for it or whoever does. But but I think that's that's life. You know, you can make a, you know, David, I think it's not a, you know, it's not a, an agenda item for us. And I, I think um, if, no, I, I, just, I would I, like to ask for, a, you know, a motion to adjourn. And if you would like to talk with this to people informally after the meeting. Uh, yeah, I, I will answer your question sure. about those bottles. You said you hope the five cents goes wherever. I will tell you where the, that five cents goes. There's a gentleman in town here who volunteers all his time. And he comes to the transfer station religiously every day and he gathers all those bottles and cans and he, and he, and he, and he brings them to the recycling facility, the recycling center somewhere, and he gets the five cents for all of those thousands and thousands of bottles and cans that he collects. And that money goes towards uh, milk vouchers for needy Needham families. And it's, it's generated a lot of money for that program and it's quite a success. So that, that was, you brought it up. I figured I'd just kind of let you know that that goes to a very worthy cause right. and it's a result of a lot of hard work on behalf of that gentleman who comes to the transfer. I've seen him. We've talked about him. I mean, we, we, we talked about the even competition and a little bit like that and uh, somewhat, but he, you know, always, it was always reflected on that he did it for a good cause. It's a good cause. Uh, His uh, name is Jeff, by the way. If you see him, say hi. Okay. Uh, so the, um, I so I, I would so David, if you want to ask for you know the people's uh, opinions on how to deal with the non-compliance uh, uh, liquor uh, stores, uh, you could do that after we adjourn the meeting, um, it, it, unless people want to disagree with that. But uh, and, and, but I'd like to put them up, ask for a motion to adjourn unless.
someone wants to continue the discussion. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Oh, I have aye. aye. Any opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good evening.